you know, when we when we when we create a huge shift in the system and release something that's been holding a lot of trauma patterns and protection patterns in place, and then that becomes released. It's almost like the whole system sometimes sometimes has to reconfigure mm -hmm. around that huge change. Hello, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madia Sosan podcast. Today we have Charmaine Barry. Now, Charmaine is a qualified psyche therapist with over 20 years of experience, which includes training in counseling, CBT, EMDR, internal family systems. Uh, to date, she has worked with over 1,000 people. The healing needs have been beautifully and richly diverse in all respects and she has been honored to witness and collaborate on so many transformational journeys. Charmin's interest has evolved into exploration of the dualistic uh, nature of our reality and the role of the ego within this realm. Now, this woman has packed so much knowledge about our psyche over the last 20 years and I can't wait to find out more about her journey and the work that she does. Hi, Charmaine. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Enjoying that we had sunshine for a couple of days in Manchester, so it's been great. Yeah, it's been gorgeous. Yeah, so um, I met you through our good friends Daniel and Christina at one of the events and uh, since then I became uh, your friend and then you were giving a talk in um, this festival, I can't remember the name of it, uh, and you were talking about IFS and things like that and I was like, I need to get this woman on my podcast because she's amazing. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, obviously our listeners don't know who you are. So uh, could you give us a brief overview of your, um, uh, of your, a bit about yourself, basically? Yeah, sure. So my name is Charmaine Berry. And um, at the moment, I'm working as a therapist. Um, my background is in psychology. I did a psychology degree some time ago. Um, then I trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. Then I went on to training EMDR, um, and that led me into different kinds of therapies, which which explore the psyche. So I trained in ego state therapy, mm -hmm. and then that led me on to internal family systems, which we'll be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and more recently, I've been exploring A Course in Miracles and looking at the bigger picture in terms of the ego and the ego realm. Um, which is which has been really fascinating. So yeah, I help people on a one-to-one -one basis, and also run uh, workshops and some groups, and uh, yeah, and also do some voluntary work at a, a project in Hume, the Nice Centre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I keep myself busy. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's a good thing because you know people on personal development path. That's the, the we are always busy doing something. We don't have time for anything else, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so, um, what was your childhood like, you know, how was your upbringing? Yeah, I think, I think like everybody's childhoods, it, it kind of, there's different threads to it and there's different levels to it and layers to it. So it depends which narrative I want to sort of thread out through that. Um, so, um, yeah, on the whole, it was good. Um, I was born in the seventies and lived in quite a remote place with my parents and younger brother, um, we lived on a farm. Um, so on one level, it was very free. We played out a lot in nature and um, my dad was a real adventurer. And so it would take us away every summer. So we did a lot of travel around Europe um, mm. as a kid. And um, yeah, I went to a lovely little primary school and, and it was lovely. Um, but then there's the kind of like the trauma narrative that kind of sits within that as well, which I'm sure everybody can relate to. Um, and that there was alcohol in the house um, and also there was some abuse um, and difficulties at school as well and I think because of like some of the things that were going on at home that obviously sort of impacts on on how you are just generally as a kid 
Mm. And so I think that reflected, I had a quite a difficult experience at school where um, I was hit in front of the class by one of the teachers. Really? I think that had a sort of an impact as well. So lots and lots and lots of things. I think I was quite a happy little kid and quite jolly and like people. Mm. Um, I like to sing and dance and, uh, and show off and, you know, just all those usual things. Um, so, yeah, just many, many layers to it. Mm. So how, how was the relationship uh, with your parents then? You said On the whole, alcohol. Pretty good. yeah, I mean, you don't know when you're in your childhood what, what you don't know, you know, mm. so everything just seems like really normal, I suppose. And, um, you know, they were both quite good fun. They were very young parents, um, so they still wanted to have fun, I suppose. Mm. Um, and the relationship was generally good. It got more strained with my father as I got older. He was quite strict. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of kind of like normalised stuff what we might call normalised trauma in childhood. So it was very, very strict on sort of timekeeping and what time to be in. I got grounded an awful lot. Um, mm. There were some tensions there. I think because of what was happening earlier on, um, you know, sort of rebelling quite a lot in teenage years. Um, I found a lot of solace in, in going out as young as I could. I was sort of trying to get into nightclubs at mm. a very young age yeah. <laughs> and trying to drink and... Um, that that sort of behavior and I think that obviously really clashed with um 80s style dad mm. <laughs> back then so it was it got quite turbulent so <clears throat> I think I left home quite early left home at 17 which you know when I look at my 17 year old daughter now is like wow <laughs> mm. um seemed like such a young age but I think I just wanted to get out of what I didn't I didn't quite understand the impact it was having on me I think I just felt like I needed to to sort of move on which was mm. I think easier to do in those days yeah you know like a lot of um people who are in the line of psychology not all of them but they they're um they have some sort of trauma that they've been through from childhood or things like yeah. that you know and then they become they go on to help other people did you have anything like that happen to you when you were younger yeah for sure i think even though again not realizing it at the time under the heading of like i want to help other people um, I sort of, it wasn't until I got into my mid twenties, really, I think I'd always thought I was like really kind and sort of really helpful to people. Um, maybe a little bit sort of, well, not a little bit, but rescuing and, uh, not realizing how wounded I was myself at the time. So I think I did my first sort of introduction to counseling course, um, when I was about 23, something like that. I just felt drawn to it. I didn't really know why. Um, and I felt really drawn to psychology. So I think also like under the under the disguise of helping others, subconsciously I was I was seeking out help for myself. Mm. Um, but found it way too difficult to to even be able to put those pieces together. I can only do that in hindsight now with the benefit of time. Um, but also too afraid to to reach out or to admit to things. There was a lot of shame um around that I didn't even realize at the time so I think I sort of got you know a kind of a calling to help others which was really the calling to help myself so I think that happens to an awful lot if not all therapists mm -hmm. and, and, and healers and helpers so do you think that you uh your over the years your your mental health was unstable um how, how did like if something's happened to you, I mean, a lot of us go through quite a lot of, a lot of traumatic. It doesn't have to be a major tra trauma. It could be a subtle trauma and it becomes sort of like it grows, 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 grows. Do you, yeah. Did you think that there's, you know, you said there was alcohol involved in your household and things like that. Did you think that that sort of impacted your, you going out drinking? Did it impact your own mental health? Yeah, for sure. I think like when you, when you're, when you're experiencing adversity in, in your childhood, um, you develop coping strategies and usually they um, um, involve just whatever was around in your childhood. So my dad certainly used alcohol a lot to cope with his trauma. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of just freely available and it was completely normalized thing, thing to do. Um, so I think it just, you know, it just seemed like a normal thing to do was drinking from quite a young, a young age. Um, so it always seemed like a sort of a social setting. There was always a reason to go out. You know, there was always like some event or disco or something going on. We had like an under 18s um, club, a nightclub uh, where, I, where I lived in Bolton. So 
Um, so yeah, I think that's certainly that played that played a role. I think it depends on what's going on in your your environment. You know, you sort of adopt those same strategies. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, like I said, the, to, the traumatic life experiences that you go through is actually does make you stronger. And sometimes, you know, when you know that your own parents or someone you love, you know that they have a lot of trauma, but they they using. Uh, alcohol or other things like some people turn to drugs and things like that you know to shield that trauma um and yeah. it's it's uh, it, it's 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 not an easy path like you know obviously but um it's it's how it is and yeah and you uh, don't realize that you, you don't know it while you're in it because everything mm. just seems so normal mm. um so yeah it's just it's just in hindsight and you don't know you're having traumatic experiences mm. you know you might just be feeling separate or different or a bit surreal or like you don't fit in with people or just feeling like you know sort of dissociated from things a little bit without knowing that that's what it is you know you're feeling quite depressed or anxious and not knowing and I think there's a kind of a um, a blanket of shame that goes over that that stops you know people from talking about it especially back in the 70s mm, <laughs> yeah. the 80s you know it did these things we're, we're in we're in really sort of fortunate times in the sense that we are opening up now and talking about these things and, and able to put those pieces together mm. and see how that trauma has, as you say, sort of built you or informed, informed who you are. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Um, uh, you know, going back to, you know, when you said you were in school and one of the teachers hit you, um, how, how did you feel around that? Like, you know, cause it's, in in our in our law and you know when I was in Pakistan, I my um I used to have a really abusive teacher. So, um you know she she would get me in front of the class and she would ask me to read something. And if I couldn't, if I made a mistake, she would punch me at the back. She would slap me. She you know, and you know when you're around five six year old, you don't you don't think anything of it until you get to a point where oh my god. I'm having self-worth issues. I'm having this sort of issues because it's going back, it's linking back to uh, the, what teacher was doing to me. So do you think that that um, that played a lot in your life? The, I think so, yeah. I think yeah. especially in the backdrop of, you know, how things were at home sometimes as well. Um, so it, it, it was a one-off for me, you know, and, and, and the, there were so many factors, so many variables around the incident that did go on to play quite a mm. significant role, I think, mm. later on, um, in that I was caught cheating. <laughs> it was a test and I was having a little sneaky peek at the back <laughs> of the book, forgetting that the teacher was sat right behind me. Oh, yeah. um, she was quite a difficult character anyway. Mm. And um, so I'm having a little peek just because, you know, looking back in hindsight, I just wanted to do well. <laughs> mm. That's all. I wanted to get the best grade that I could. And I really wanted to impress this teacher that, you know, at that point I had a lot of respect for and a lot of love for I think I was only about eight years old something like that mm. um so there I'm having a little peek and then the next minute you know there's just all hell broke loose mm. and um, I was getting dragged I got dragged off the chair and dragged into the front of the class and um um it was just very shocking just like really really shocking mm. uh I was pulled out she sat down she put me over her knee she lifted my skirt up mm. I mean I don't know whether you know how this would ever uh, be able to happen in these days and then you know got got really smacked and she was shouting oh you're a cheat and all kinds of things at me mm. um and I was just in absolute absolute shock and I remember standing up and um the whole class was in shock as well and wanting to cry but you know having to like push those tears down and like these you know even even then these like really strong managers being being um developed to to protect me you know in front of mm. Uh, the class and, and stop me from feeling even more humiliated mm. and then sat back down again um but I've, do, I've done a lot of work on it it kept coming up in therapy over and over again over the years mm. um because I had issues with public speaking mm. you know if, I, if ever I stood up in front of a room full even just more than two people say to speak this horrible panic would would come over me mm. you know and yeah. um it, it it had that impact for sure because at that time what, what's happening in the traumatic memory is that the mind is is taking a snapshot of all the conditions that are, that are taking place so you know and it was creating beliefs around 
um, if, you know, if, you, if you're in front of people, you get exposed, you're going to be really humiliated. Mm-hmm. Um, it broke a lot of trust with adults and authority. Um, it put me off school. I think mm. my school oh, yeah. uh, attendance and enthusiasm and motivation after that was really, really affected. I just sort of gave up a little bit, you know, and mm. um, and that kind of thing. So it, it had a really deep, it, there was many, 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 many layers to it that I didn't fully heal. I thought I'd healed it and I realized I hadn't healed it. Yeah, there's um, always so, a layer to all layers, your healing. <laughs> layers, layers, layers of it on the cognitive, the emotional, how it was stored physically all the different aspects of like trust and getting into trouble. I could never cheat again. Mm. I could telling a lie was such a big deal. Um, All those kinds of things, always terrified of getting into trouble and looking over my shoulder kind of stuff. Mm. You know, it was just really exacerbating stuff, but it wasn't until I really deeply healed. This was when I, when was when I forgave Mm. the teacher and I could really look her in the eyes, you know, in, in my own inner world and really let go of, uh, let go of that that this huge shift sort of uh, occurred. So it helped me to understand a lot about the process of, of healing and trauma mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. To, to help inform me and, and of course people that I work with as well. Yeah. So, so thank you, Mrs. Livingstone. He's probably no longer oh. <laughs> with us on this earth plane. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, for helping I- me in that way. Everything that you go through is shaping you into a person you're meant to become, right? So um you know even going back you you talking about public speaking and i'm i'm a, i'm a motivational speaker and it's like you know when i first started off i was it was the same case i couldn't even stand in front of five people in in the class and you yeah. know um while learning going through the spe- public speaking it was being a bit of a healing journey myself so it's not only i'm not healing other people motivating other people i'm motivating myself as well and healing past all the traumatic experiences so it's all it's always a healing journey it's always and we, we don't sometimes we don't recognize it but it's it's a healing <laughs> yeah. every day <laughs> every day yeah absolutely so you know um obviously you've you've been through like um, um traumatic life experiences and and obviously you went um way off the rails you know like partying and drinking and things like that so what was the point uh what was the turning point where where you know you you blah, blah, blah. what was the point i'm trying to get my words out here sorry guys um yeah. what was the turning point that led you on the path of transformation the, the, again there's many many layers to that and i think uh i think i think i think what i now refer to as holy spirit you know or the divine or um, that within me was, was trying to help me all along the way. You know, there was little indicators there. I kind of had a first mini spiritual awakening around the age of 21. Mm. Um, and it was really weird. It just happened. I was uh, working away and uh, looking after two big dogs as part of the job. And I just felt this shift, like this just difference and like this sort of sense of love. And I just really connected with these dogs that I'd never really had much time for animals in that way. But I just just this kind of a shift and that kick-started a whole line of curiosity. Um, I think the first book I bought was a Jonathan Cain book on tarot or magic or something Mm, mm. and just started reading that and um, um, and exploring things especially with my mum we both sort of had this sort of thing at the same time and then going to spiritualist churches and just like what is this and like this whole world just opened up and Mm. I remember being in the library. There's no internet back then. Just being in the library and getting book after book after book of, you know, and anything that I could find around that. Um, and then I sort of decided I was going to dedicate my 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 whole life to spirituality. Mm. Um, and then I found techno and clubs <laughs> <laughs> oh, at the same time. And I pulled off the path again. Um, so I had to go off and explore that. Which again, I think that certainly got spiritual tones to it as well. You know, mm. sort of being in that collective community as it was back in back in in those days early 90s really um and then I think it's just always been there in the background and never and never really left and then it's been really interesting like through the exploration and the study of psychology how that kept sort of interweaving with with spirituality as well and just keeping me really interested in what's going on in this sort of um in around so yeah, and it was only perhaps maybe after doing the EMDR training about mm. nine years ago, I can't remember now, mm. but, you know, that sort of, again, allowing that kind of spiritual stuff to come into the 
into the psychology. Um, and then on my own journey, I had like a breakdown um, when I got to about 35, something like that um, as well. And that really helped also. I had a meltdown, I had a young child. It was really busy. I had a very stressful job. I was a CBT therapist at the time. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, whether there's one sort of defining kind of moment, I don't know. It seems to be like just be an unfolding really that just keeps getting deeper and deeper, um, mm. especially so this year, I would say, because I've had the time, as a lot of us have, to really deepen that that sort of connection mm. and realising that, you know, the spirituality is really the, dis the discovery of myself, like the, the real nature of, of who I am. Mm. Um, and, and, that's, and, and again, in hindsight, looking back, I can see that that's really been you know, the sort of, that's been the path without realizing it. It looks mm -hmm. like you're building a career or you're trying to make money or you're mm -hmm. looking after your kid or, you know, whatever it is, but actually it's just been there gently and whispering in the background, mm -hmm. you know, all the time. Um, I also have had some experiences with plant medicine over time as well and sort of looking at shamanism and the world of Tantra and just off on all these little journeys everywhere. And there's been big moments within within those big moments as well. Yeah. Um, have have yeah. you taken ayahuasca or anything like that? Have you taken that? I have, yes, yeah. I have oh, done. what was that experience like for you? Um, yeah, really significant. I'm still contemplating it, to be honest, and still putting it into perspective because, you know, back then doing that, I didn't have such a strong spiritual framework to sort of embed it into. So even now, you know, I look back on some of those experiences and, 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 re, and I'm sort of re-evaluating the messages um, and the things that I was shown in, in, in those experiences. So again, it's layered. There's just, <laughs> there's just so many layers. What it did do for me personally was really connect me back to the significance of, of for example, the water and the earth and the planet and, you know, sort of, reawakening a deep sense of gratitude for that it's like a reorientation if you like to mm. to what is the bigger picture um and kind of there's just yeah there's just so many different it's it's hard to say and also you know kind of sense of community and the importance of, of connection with with other people as well and how important that is on the spiritual path so mm. yeah it's yeah there's, there's yeah. so many different layers I was watching this TED talk uh, by, I don't know who it was, but he was talking about um, a spiritual, a spiritual awakening or psychosis or something like that. And he was talking about how the West and the East treat the spiritual awakening or here is like all sort of mental disorders. And in, in the East is it's actually isn't a mental disorder. It's, it's a spiritual awakening. So they kind of help you to sort of, you know, help you navigate through your awakening. Whereas here they just like give you drugs, you put you in the hospital and things like that. So he was, it was, it's a really, really, um, um, like a really good talk that he was giving and um do you think that we it's it's the same case here like you, you know it's there's a huge difference between the west and the east absolutely yeah i'm really i'm really glad you mentioned this um because the, there there is um e even even the i don't even like to use the words mental health <laughs> mm. i find it you know not not a very helpful kind of heading really mm. for you know and all the little subtitles that are underneath that in terms of even what we call depression anxiety and these kind of labels that we've all got very used to um so it, it it's really it's really great that you um bringing that up um so yeah i think we do i think mental health as we know it is actually the human experience mm. um what we are actually contending with when when we te when we seem to be talking about these things are the conditions of the ego and this kind of big belief system that's sort of stuck on us if you like through which we're we're operating which is negatively charged mm -hmm. uh, which has at its basis very negative emotions mm -hmm. like shame and fear um, and all the derivatives of that and um and and that's what we are really um, needing to, to, to understand that is part of the human experience. Um, and instead of trying to sort of fix it within the, the ego 
sort of conditions, if you like, and, and these kind of negative emotions, we need to have a, a bigger picture perspective, which is embracing the spiritual. And I think that's the difference between the East and the West. Mm. We do not do that no. here, or we haven't done until recently, which is where IFS, I think, sort of introduces itself into the into the Western sort of psyche yeah. as a, um, a psychotherapy that does does actually do that. So it's very, very, very important. I think when we say mental health, we're kind of shrinking something down mm. um, and, and totally not really putting it into the, into the wider um, context. So this is a really, really important conversation to have. I, I would get rid of the term mental health altogether yeah. because I think the language informs a lot of the way that we conceptualize what, what's happening to us. Um, mm. So yeah, in a way that they haven't done in the, in the East. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, you just mentioned about IF, I, I, IFS. Um, so can you tell, uh, uh, tell us a bit more about what IFS is and what sort of work you do with your clients and, you know, like an example of uh, like the work that you do? Yeah, okay, sure. So I trained in IFS um, around five years ago. I started the training. So um, uh, it's actually called Internal Family Systems. It was um, developed by a guy, is still being by a chap called uh, Richard Schwartz over in the USA. And uh, I was just really, really flukily, um, just really lucky that I got to train with Dick um, on three separate trainings, which was amazing. Mm. Uh, he's such a lovely guy. And um, it's basically tapping into ancient knowledge and tapping into what I would say is the condition and the nature of, of our mind. And Dick Schwartz has sort of identified that, I suppose, in a Western, in a more of a Western kind of way. Um, and it's two basic premises are that essentially we all have a connection to source, mm. uh, which we call in this model, the self energy, with a capital S, the self, who we really, really, really are. Mm. And we can take that to mean the divine or the Holy Spirit or God within us. Um, or whatever kind of sits most comfortably with, with your belief system. And that, that remains always and forever undamaged and is essentially who we are. Yeah. What we are experiencing uh, day to day is what we see, what we're seeing through our eyes and, and, and emotions. And we're also hearing thoughts mm. all of the time. Yeah. <laughs> it never ever stops. Never. <laughs> and when we really tune into the nature of that, it is quite negative in, 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 in mm. sort of its tone, I suppose. Um, but what Dick Schwartz uh, realized was that this is a whole system um, that others may sort of refer to as the ego as well. And that this is made up of many, many, just what he simply calls different parts, mm. which are actually all sort of separate little kind of personalities in their own like, right, little autonomous beings, if you like, mm. that are all holding their own little histories um, and assumptions and beliefs about, about things. And this is what we are actually hearing um, in the content of our thoughts. We're actually listening to our managers talking to what feels like to us, but actually they're kind of mainly talking amongst themselves um, and sort of within the context of their experience of what is being perceived in, in, in our outside world. So they're kind of receiving that information and interpreting it from their point of view, what we might call our beliefs, yeah. um, and then sort of projecting that experience back out, I suppose, through through our behaviours. And because um, this is kind of brought online, if you like, uh, during childhood, it's kind of absorbed all those traumatic and adverse experiences that we were talking about um and has been kind of programmed if you like to understand that it needs to continuously protect us mm. from those things happening to us again mm. so it's quite fear based in its in its kind of um essence if you like and it's quite hyper vigilant to threat and risk and it's constantly ready to alert us to the possibility of that regardless to what's actually happening in the outside in the outside world mm -hmm. so our inner experience if you like which is plugged into our whole nervous system and emotional system pretty much dictates the kind of experience that we're having as, as, as what we think as, as human beings which is in fact not really us it's not the essence of who we are it's 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 the kind of the the, the energy of this system that we are being governed by mm -hmm. in, in a way 
um, it's very preemptive. It's kind of, you know, when we're hearing that, oh, what if this happens and what if that happens? And it's kind of like going into the future. What we're hearing is our managers trying to protect us by preempting what could possibly happen in the future. Um, it's also kind of the storehouse, if you like, for, for, for the traumatic memories. Um, and um, which we call, which are usually held by what we call exile parts in that system. Mm. So, um, so yeah, it's just that beautiful combination of understanding who we truly, truly are. Mm. There's a lot of relief in that, that we are not this system. Um, but it's also very noisy, you know, and it's got our attention a lot of the time. It's our worldview, it's our opinion, it's mm. who we think we are. It's sort of got all these different emotions and personalities within it. Um, and it's what people tend to be, this is what we call sort of mental health, is actually the experience that we're having when, when we are noticing how these different parts are jumping in and out of our nervous system, depending on what it perceives to be, to be a threat. Um, so I help people to navigate that using this model, which is essentially what it's a navigation tool, essentially, to go into this, um, to, into the system to, uh, to heal it. And we do that by essentially con con uh, connecting with the exiles that are holding the trauma and helping that to release. Um, so, but we have to we have to embrace that this spiritual element to us, the self energy. In order to do that, we sort of bring the self energy to the parts as, as an essential part of the healing process. Mm. Um, so it really demands that kind of consideration of what else, who else mm. am I and that, and that connection to, to source. So I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, um, I've only just come across it, uh, about a couple of weeks ago. And then obviously you were talking about it as well, um, in the, uh, event and I've had like a couple of sessions done, um, recently as well. And it's, it's, it is quite intense. You know, when you have trauma, you think you've gone past your trauma, you've healed it, like you said, and at the layers are, oh my God. So recently we've been working with numbness. So, you know, uh, what happened, what I found out is that like the reason I'm feeling numb, um, most of the time is because, um, I've I, I've had a traumatic life experiences and now my parts of me are really good at shielding uh, me from pain. Yeah. So um, so it's in after the session, like, you know, does it does it like is it is it like after the sessions when you have the sessions, you could go either way, whether you feel amazing after doing the, the sessions or you can go the other way completely you know, because you're healing and you're cleansing and um, you could just complete. I couldn't get even get out of bed like for several days after the session, but I knew what was going on. And, the, you know, I'm on, you know, a lot of us on a path of personal development and we know the healing process. We know we're healing, we're clearing, but it's, it's a model that is, isn't really recognized in the, in the system at the moment where, because it's where they're like afraid to touch on, um, anything going beyond the surface point. Whereas we dive, dive deeper. Do you think, do you think it will it will come in this in 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 their current system or maybe in the future or is it are we heading that way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. IFS actually got evidence based status um, in the states. I think it was in twenty eighteen or maybe last year, hmm. which is massive. You know, that means that people basically can claim this on their insurance and hmm. um, you know get referred. I think it's it's happening more in their health system in the states um and the interest in it since then has absolutely exploded um i think yeah what you're saying is, is really right i think in terms of in the same way that we kind of dissociate in a way and cut off the the kind of deeper traumas within us i think our whole healthcare system has done that as well mm. and has, has, has sort of uh, not dared to go there yet i mm. think therapists find it difficult to go there in their own you know, most of us are unhealed. Most of us are wounded in our practices. So we don't want to go there either. Mm -hmm. Plus, we haven't really had the intervention to, to guide us. And um, it's been a very, very scary world of, of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, in CBT and in my CBT training, for example, we were told not to go to trauma. Don't go to the past. <laughs> don't go to that scary place. Mm -hmm. Keep it about the here and now. Just focus on the actual thoughts. 
mm. you know, the negative thinking and change the, the sort of substance of that, which doesn't work um, in a lot of cases. It certainly has its place, but it, you know, essentially it's not, it's not sort of deeper healing. So, um, so I certainly see that this is that, I think this is part of our evolution moving forward. Like we want to go in there now. We're fed up with feeling terrible. We've tried taking the pills. We've sat and had the psychiatric assessments and not really got anywhere. Or we tried to speak to a counselor and then just felt weird yeah. afterwards. And, you know, those kinds of experiences that we've tried and given up on perhaps, you know, I think we've tried everything. Um, when in fact we haven't, you know, we won't, we're only just beginning, it feels like, to really, really get a, an angle on this, you know, mm -hmm. and dare to go into this sort of frontier, the final frontier, which is going into our own sort of psyches and, and, and meeting that. Mm -hmm. Some people call that sort of shadow work or facing your demons and all these kind of elaborate sort of terms that we've got, you know, that are sort of dressing it up around with that, yeah. which is really essentially just going in and looking at our own wounded mm -hmm. children that are still existing concurrently in our, in our experiences that are still waiting to be healed. And now we have this amazing tool that, that helps us to, to do that. And excitingly, somebody got in touch with me last week from the UK to say that their um, NHS trust had agreed to fund uh, IFS training. Oh, amazing. Um, this chap works in um, uh, complex, with complex trauma. And, you know, the therapies that we have at the moment just don't cut it with complex trauma mm. uh, and can actually be quite re-traumatizing. Mm. And, um, and so that was just such great news that we can see that even in the UK, it's, mm. it's starting to sort of filter through. And I think, and I'm seeing it on forums as well, for example, you know, EMDR therapists and people that are now doing the IFS training are like, oh, this is amazing, you know. Mm. Um, what's also brilliant about IFS is that you can blend it in with whatever approach you are using it totally supports mm. everything so we've got practitioners from all the different kind of areas within the healing field um, having this as a kind of a, a way to to really expand the, the way that they can they can heal by understanding the nature of the way that this is is organized really mm. is, is extremely extremely powerful um, in terms of what you were saying as well about how does it feel afterwards, I think that really does vary uh, from, from session to session yeah. and whichever sort of parts you're working with. Mm. You know, when we, when, we, when we create a huge shift in the system and release something that's been holding a lot of trauma patterns and protection patterns in place and then that becomes released, it's almost like the whole system sometimes, sometimes has to reconfigurate mm. around that huge change. So it can feel like that. Um, also sometimes, you know, there, there might be parts in the system that don't agree with what's happened or were dependent on that particular substance use, for example, or, or whatever. So sometimes we can, we can have a sort of a backlash around that as well. Mm. Um, but in therapy, we always ensure as trained therapists that we make sure that we minimize the, the impact of that as much as possible, mm. um, by, you know, making sure the whole system knows that it's included in the healing so it doesn't have to try and get your attention again. And yeah. sometimes you just need to rest. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And time out and recover and just, you know. Yeah. And I feel so amazing after that. You know, it's uh, the, sometimes sessions are so amazing. Like uh, I could just feel instant like, oh, I've I've released something. I've, I've healed something. But then sometimes it's like I'm completely in bed day and allow myself to cry. And that's another thing, you know, in uh, like you said, mentioned before, um, I was in an hour of counseling and they weren't, weren't barely, you know, scratching the surface and um, I was constantly th told, you know, when you're having that pain feeling, distract yourself with watching a TV or do this, that and the other. So your pain is not there. So you're not really, they're not, they don't really tell you to heal past the trauma. The only way for 15 years, I was in, in and out of counseling, never got anywhere with my trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's only until I started doing the deep inner work with the other therapists and IFS and it's 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 amazing within a couple of months to a year I feel absolutely amazing you know and it's it's I, I don't know why we don't have that in our system and hope, I'm hoping that more and more people will uh, recognize this and I'm hoping more and more people just like meditation it, it was like a couple of years ago nobody really cared about like you know meditation now some of the 
schools are bringing it in and you know which is so beautiful to see yeah i can i can so i can definitely see that happening you know i've met so many amazing inspiring people just doing the ifs training and in the ifs community um there's a chap called dr neil hawks and he has an amazing project in values-based education mm. and he and his wife jane have, have both trained in ifs and they're bringing through the back door at the moment mm. <laughs> it feels but you know bringing these models models in and you can really feel the force of it coming up and beyond because because we're ready mm. you know, i think everything happens in in divine timing Absolutely. and it's part of a bigger plan and it's sort of part of our evolution if you like that mm. in lots and lots of ways we've been prepared mm. um to, to do this and you know i think there's going to be many many well i've seen this as well many therapists counselors um training in, in ifs because mm. it just makes sense <laughs> it just makes it, 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 yeah. absolute sense that like everybody who hears about it and discovers more about it mm. can you just it's just like light bulb moments of mm. like you can totally relate to it mm. absolutely absolutely totally agree with that mm. now you mentioned uh emdr um a, a few times uh can you explain to us what the uh, emdr is okay so um, it's, uh, it means eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. And it's a trauma processing intervention. It's extremely interesting. Um, and uh, back 10 years ago, it was the only um, trauma intervention that was in the NHS NICE guidelines as a treatment of choice. Mm -hmm. So it was either CBT, which doesn't really have a very strong trauma focused model mm -hmm. um, and DMDR. So um, Basically, it was it was developed back in the 80s by a psychologist who sort of stumbled across, as the story goes, this idea mm -hmm. that um, that we can process negative emotion and the memories associated to that through a process of bilateral stimulation, which bas basically means sort of stimulating the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. um, so primarily the technique that is used are eye movements, mm -hmm. um, which, which therapists do either with their hand or they have these sort of light little mm -hmm. machines that we follow or we can do it with uh, auditory notes or tapping or tapping or mm -hmm. whichever. And um, to put it in a, a nutshell, it's a lot more complicated than this. It does sound it. <laughs> <laughs> as we focus in on a memory network. So trauma is stored on a whole memory sort of network. Mm -hmm. um, principally for sort of encoding five different aspects, including the sensory stuff, the images um, included in that, the kind of thoughts that we were having through the through the trauma, the beliefs that we derive from that, the way it went into the cells, like the somatic experience of that. So it's complex, there's many layers to that. So um, they discovered that if you sort of focused on the memory network and especially the also the negative, what they call the negative cognition, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the thought and the, uh, the thought narrative that you were having at the time and make, keep that in your mind's eye and in your sort of somatic um, experience as well. And then do these eye movements or the bilateral stim, whichever way you do that, and just keep focusing on that. That eventually um, the memory literally kind of fades or depixelates mm -hmm. or transforms itself. Um, I, I was thinking about this yesterday because it's so interesting when they're trying to explain how EMDR works because you know you're just moving your eyes and how come how come this massive thing happens mm. um what the theory holds is that what we are connecting to by connecting the right brain to the left brain is what they call the adaptive information processor yeah. um which is the, the ability that we all have to to sort of adapt this information um so and I was thinking about that and then I was wondering whether it was just a clever way and another term to use for the Holy Spirit that we're actually joining the trauma, which we could say might be held on the left hand side of the brain, moving that information over to the right hand side and then connecting these two things mm. um, in order to heal, to like bring the truth over to the trauma. I mean, that trauma doesn't exist anymore. Mm. The belief that you were having in that moment whilst it was happening to you is not true. Mm. <laughs> it's not because you deserve to be shouted at um, or because you are vulnerable and all these sorts of things. Actually, in our power, in our source, we're invulnerable. <laughs> we deserve nothing less than love. Mm. So I often have heard, and having done EMDR 
over so many years, people having these realizations, literally, as we're starting to join these two hemispheres of like, I'm frightened or, you know, whatever it is to, my God, you know, this is just not true. Or the, another voice coming in mm. saying this is in the past now, you know, and this kind of reorganization of that traumatic material so that it processes, it kind of lets itself go um, in, 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 a, in a way. So there's lots of discussion around EMDR and and, and kind of its um, efficacy, if you like. And, um, you know, if we don't understand the complexity of how the, the system organizes itself, EMDR can be less effective uh, mm. some people. Although I think they are recognizing this and there's different what they call sort of protocols within the um within the treatments uh, to mm. to address that but basically it's pretty mind-blowing really yeah <laughs> and uh, <laughs> very 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 powerful you know it is something that they do suggest you only do with a therapist because we're effectively sort of kicking doors open it takes you on this journey of like what you need to heal next and what you need to heal next and it'll just bring this material to the surface as you're doing these eye movements sometimes you know wow um, so it's very 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 fascinating mm. it is a very fascinating technique is this in the in a in a, in the system or is it coming through the back door right now as well in the system this is actually in the system and not many people know that mm. um, so so if you know what you're asking for <laughs> you know if you know your problems are trauma related mm. especially if it's what we might call sort of later trauma around car accidents or what they call sort of single mm. event traumas um that you know with with, with 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 that kind of knowledge there are usually some emdr trained therapist mm. within a psychology department or within an nhs trust mm. um that you could ask to to to, to be assessed by they still got quite strict criteria around it and things like that mm. um but somebody i know has just been through that process and just kept insisting i know what i need i know what i need and she did oh, eventually maybe. get referred yeah. it for a long time which yeah. she did eventually get referred in for an emdr therapist and um you know, and yeah, it's, um, it's, it is, it is available. It's out there. Oh, wow. Definitely. That's amazing. I think I want one now. Can I have a session with you? <laughs> I, I really do. You want to try it. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, I want to experience this. This is amazing. Yeah. It is, I actually use it less. I mean, I don't, you know, I still do. I mean, it was my main, you know, sort of intervention after I, when I first trained it, I was like, wow, this is like, incredible because we understand and that that you know emdr really switched me onto that onto this understanding mm. that every single symptom that you are experiencing in the here and now without doubt is related to something that happened to you in the past mm. okay mm. so it really helps us to sort of you know reinterpret what's happening um when we get triggered in the present moment it's not it's not necessarily about what's just happened in front of you or what that person has just said to you or how rude that person is or how that person shouldn't be dropping litter on the floor or people should be wearing masks in the, you know, in the current time or not wearing or whatever that, whatever that trigger is, mm. what we do is project it straight out into the situation. Mm. When in fact, what we need to do, that trigger is it's almost like a holy instant. It's, it's a calling for you to go into your system and connect with this and you will always find that's related to something that happened to you that mm. is unprocessed so if we can begin to shift our a kind of um our understanding of our experience to that and start to really come inside and address what's happening for us in our in personal emotional system in the face of whatever we think is going on out here mm. um then then that's where the deeper healing happens you know mm. and emdr really really helped me to understand that they just take it for granted that that is the case in a way that no other therapy model had ever let us think like that before mm. it was always about you know the abuse or kind of even blaming the trauma when actually we need to come into that and still heal that mm. um, which is incredible i think this as well is 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 a big part of what the true awakening is yeah you know, that's that is it, beautiful kind of, like really yeah. really beautiful so um you know me and you were having a pre-chat before and um you mentioned uh about did now it's a it's a disorder that i've never heard of and i'm sure many of our listeners haven't um mm. heard of um what is a did yeah so uh that means dissociative identity disorder 
don't know, mm-hmm. it's a long psyche. Mm-hmm. Um, in the uh, older days, we would have called this multiple personality disorder. Um, again, disorder is like one of those words, mm-hmm. like mental and mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, uh, you know, it sort of captures um, uh, more sort of understandably what, what, what the human experience is. And it kind of taps into what we we're talking to before um, in terms of parts, these different parts that we have uh, in, our, in our minds. So, um, so, yeah, once upon a time, we would have um, sort of described that as multiple personality disorder, which gives the impression that somebody can have different, absolute different personalities all existing within their within their being, which isn't, mm. which isn't sort of strictly true. What it is kind of pointing to is the fact that within our ego realm, we do have all these different parts that do have different personalities. Mm. Um, and that kind of happens on a, on a spectrum, depending on what kind of earlier trauma you may have had. So, um, so in the face of adversity, we're kind of creating these different personalities and these different parts within us that we're all kind of used to. We all know that one minute we can be like absolutely great and fine. And the next minute we're really angry or sometimes we're like, oh, I just lost it. And I became like, you know, sort of really aggressive or really down. And we've got these different sort of like experiences that come in and out of our nervous system. So, um, but generally we kind of have a sense of who we are and it's kind of a bit more integrated and we recognize and we understand that we've gone from one kind of, you know, sort of, um, tight and power into into another with people with DID what tends to happen is like those those kind of um parts become even more dissociated from each other Hmm. and kind of and can be more extreme so in very extreme cases it's like going into a completely separate personality type Hmm. without the other personality of the parts realizing that Hmm. um it's almost like a conscious awareness of the whole isn't available so Hmm. it feels very extreme and very separated Mm. um with the id i've got a little quote here about it actually i can read that without my um glasses yeah (laughs) (laughs) so um so the personality of one person is comprised of many parts that are not yet functioning together in a smooth coordinated and flexible way Mm. Uh, that's boone et al and um yeah there isn't a kind of a sense of a unified person Mm. with somebody with the id Mm. um as it is with, with the rest of us that also have all these different parts but we mm. have this kind of sense of wholeness of, of, yeah. of who we are do you think like a person with DID would uh find it really difficult to form a relationship friendships and things like that because i know a lot with disorders um it, it's it's uh, like with body dysmorphia or things like that you know there's it's it's harder to maintain uh when you're feeling low about yourself or your low self-esteem it's harder to maintain relationships and friendships and things like that yeah. i think we all do to some extent mm. you know I think there's always some kind of like special need, you know, when we're looking for relationships and again, driven from this kind of sense of lack that is very dominant within, within the ego system, within the system. So maybe we do attract people for all the wrong reasons, the right reasons as well. But, you know, we know there's a lot of codependency that happens in relationships and Mm. this expectation that somebody's going to fulfill our needs Mm. when we get with somebody. Um, And that's tough enough, you know, even when we have got a relatively sound sense of self-esteem and that we deserve a relationship and Mm. um, and deserve love and those kinds of things. But when we have a very loud critic Mm. in our system, which is constantly undermining us and telling us that we're not worthy or that you can't trust people, that you don't look good enough, that you're going to get deserted, you're going to get abandoned, this kind of narrative that we unfortunately hear, especially in what we might call at that end of the spectrum, more Mm. disordered kind of ways of of being. Of course, it's gonna be difficult to have relationship. Mm. It's gonna be difficult to trust other people, difficult to trust ourselves. Um, We can also be like, when we're talking about those hypervigilant parts that are kind of preempting terrible things happening and catastrophizing and things Mm. like that, Mm. that we can live in fear whilst we're in the relationship and all these you know, these, these fantastic things that we thought it was going to heal in us don't happen because no other person can do that for us. It is impossible. 
So we lowered this expectation onto somebody within about two weeks or whatever. Mm. Um, we realize that's not going to happen. And then we blame the person um, and we're either attacking them or we're super attacking ourselves for having been so stupid or, mm. you know, what I'm sort of picking a, a sort of a, a thread here with, with this, but of course, you know, it, 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 it is difficult to, to be in relationship anyway, especially mm. with such harsh self-criticism, which we find often in these kinds of, presentations around body dysmorphia and, and, and yeah and, and, and I think and depression and everything <laughs> yeah everything yeah so you know I think the best form of love that you could give yourself is to work on yourself dig deeper as much as you can like you know with IFS and all of the like uh, therapies not just the the therapist that's in the system but like you know like oh, IFS so. is, yeah so yeah. the more you work on yourself the more you will attract the right people because you, you like you said you end up attracting the people who are going to be your mirror so if you having a lot of negativity around your whatever you're going to have to keep attracting like some sort of like you know a, a narcissist or something who's well, gaslighting <laughs> think. We're, we're only attracting when we use this word attract which isn't strictly yeah. what's happening but we we are creating our reality all the time from, from yeah. our own systems. So we can only create the mirror of, of that. Mm. So we can see that two ways as either, you know, sort of having loads of bad luck and why is it these terrible things keep happening to me? Or we see it as an invitation to heal. Yes. When we can look through the projection of, you know, this narcissistic, and you see it a lot, and I see it a lot on Facebook, like, you know, this gaslighters and narcissists mm -hmm. and this kind of words that we use actually is just reflecting back always 100% of the time, something that needs to heal in your mind. If you have a sense of not deserving love, mm -hmm. that's massive, you know, and you're only going to reflect somebody who mirrors that back to you. Mm -hmm. So it's essential, you know, don't necessarily have to join a forum which is ganging up against all narcissists mm. and sort of trying to stop narcissism. It's just never, ever, ever going to happen yeah, <laughs> unless totally you change. You know, some people never encounter a narcissist in their whole lives because mm. they don't need that. And mm. that's the word, need that mirroring back to them. So this yeah. is this is the calling to sort of shift the way that we are conceptualizing stuff and always come back into the self, like you say, mm. dig deeper, really you know, with, in a really brutally honest, authentic to yourself, that is pure self-love, to try and mm. find that self-love. We have to move those obstacles and therefore we have to stop denying our role in what we have mirrored back in our own reality that we have created in order to heal. It's essential. Mm. That's beautifully, beautifully said. Thank you. Um, Right. Okay. So I'm aware that you currently work in Naya Center. So um, can you tell? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. You. Uh, it's, what is Naya Center? So oh, it's uh, principally it's a building in Hume right. mm -hmm. that has an amazing history. Um, we could talk about it for another hour, but I'll just skip over that. <laughs> you tell of it all. It's just amazing, and it's in the heart of Hume. I feel very connected. I don't even live in Hume, but I feel connected to it. Mm -hmm. It's a. It's. It's. Um, it's a radical community arts centre, principally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a big building which houses a theatre, this beautiful um, theatre. It's a wow. little bit dilapidated, um, but it's just gorgeous. And mm -hmm. um, it's a, a community of people that have come together, a collective, mm -hmm. and with the intention of um, oh, helping community and... Mm -hmm. um, what that means come together in a radical and creative kind of way. Mm -hmm. So I'm more um, focused on helping with the well-being center that is evolving through there and, um, in, and, and sort of bringing these newer therapies and these newer ideas into a community such as Hume for starters. Um, and we've got, you know, there's a lot of ambition there about how we can incorporate the theater into healing and these mm -hmm. sort of different modalities through trauma and more sort of social prescription kind of ideas singing groups um, um drama groups just sort of um other ways that we can come together to mm. to heal a lot of this stuff is written about also in Bessel van der Kolk's book mm. um as well as lots of other places as well and um just mentioning it's a really good 
port, first port of call book, um, The Body Keeps the Score book. Mm. And um, yeah, and then, you know, just sort of how, how does the creative arts and, and well-being kind of like meet um, is, is, is just an area that is really, really fascinating. Mm. Um, so yeah, have a look. It's the Naya Moss or um, you can look at Naya Moss Facebook page and there's a website um, or the Naya Center, NIA Center. Have a look at that if you want to get involved. It's a cooperative, so you can join as a member. Uh, and we're always looking for volunteers and practitioners and people that might want to come in and get help and, and get involved in that. So things are a little bit limited, of course, at the minute, mm -hmm. uh, with the situation. Um, but we're doing a lot of stuff online. So part of that has been Naya TV, um, which is broadcasting out all kinds of different programs. Um, of which I have a little show on there as well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's just great. It's like, it's just looking at endless possibilities of like where we can go creatively mm. and with a community led sort of feel mm. around healing. Yeah, that's Connection. beautiful. Thank you mm. for that. Um, now we're coming to uh, end, but before we go, uh, I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. <laughs> I'm just about to grill you with questions. <laughs> Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, cool. No. No, 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 well, you have to be. <laughs> We're not going to end this interview without rapid fire questions. Right, okay. So, what is your definition of God? All that is, it's everything, and it's the source from which everything was created. Oh, beautiful. Okay. How do you define religion and spirituality? religion um is perhaps where the the ego of the mind has overcomplicated and doctrinated um simple truth and put around it and set it into a whole set of rules and regulations mm -hmm. perhaps for whatever kind of reason um that um yeah yeah that's what i want to say about that <laughs> Okay, so uh, what's the lesson that took you longest to learn? Oh, yeah, that's easy, actually. Forgiveness is everything. Mm, yes. Oh, my God, yes. I'm actually working <laughs> on that every day now. Do a forgiveness prayer. Big one. <laughs> All the theories on it. It's amazing. Yeah. But I just, you know, just to, I just suggest to people that if it's not something you haven't explored, it isn't what you think it is. Mm. It's actually quantum technology. Mm. And, um, you know, I've just discovered the work of a chap called, which you remember his name? I think he's called Mike Rice, R-Y-C-E, mm. who just talks about this so amazingly. Go and have a look. If you want to fast track your healing, mm. go there. Hapono Pono is another great one. Absolutely. Absolutely. It ties into that. It's mm. technology. It's amazing. Mm. Absolutely. Um, okay. So do you believe there is an end to healing i think that we will get to a point in our evolution where we transcend this realm of suffering mm. we realize then that we don't need to heal we are healed but not in this level of consciousness that we are currently experiencing How beautifully said okay one more the world needs more of what love and forgiveness yes <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a hoponopono <laughs> amazing um so one last question uh, actually two more before um before we get on to how people can contact you um what is that one message that you would like to share with someone who's going through adversity right now who's going through darkness right now what would you tell them so if that's what you're feeling right now just very quickly just invite you to put your hand on your heart and with your eyes closed you can just repeat a soft gentle mantra to yourself that I am willing to do what it takes to heal through this and I am asking for the help that I need in order for that to happen and just even if you say that with slight little bit even just a little bit of belief that that can happen that's going to be enough and really start to call that in and open yourself up to it and open yourself up to the belief that there is nothing that cannot be healed and that you do deserve it. 
and it is there for you. And this could just be the start to just ask, 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 ask the world, ask the cosmos, ask God, ask your higher self, ask the angels, ask the earth. It doesn't matter. Just putting that call out to, to, to bring that healing into your field as a starting point. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners will um, uh, relate to what you said. And, you know, uh, and I'm, I wish them all, all the best. Um, um, OK, so how can uh, people contact you? <clears throat> so um, I have a website www.charmaineberry.co.uk um, you can contact me through there my email address is on there you can contact me through Facebook I do use Facebook quite a lot um, and um, so either send me a message through there or friend me on there it's just Charmaine Berry um, how else I think that's all, that's all the, all the mediums really you can uh, if you do follow me on Facebook I post workshops that I'm doing on there um, if you're looking for therapy, I'm generally usually full in terms of um, my case load, as it were, but please do, do uh, get in touch. I might want to signpost you or point in the right direction or there may be a space coming up at some point. Um, so do do that. I offer consultations as well as, um, as therapy sessions. So I think that's just the best way to sort of track what I'm doing to, to sort of get involved. I do have a Facebook group um, called Internal Family Systems in Manchester. Mm -hmm. So this was um, uh, created because we used to have physical meetups every month going back two or three years now. So they stopped uh, with COVID and um, I have got an intention to do an online one at some point as well. Uh, but yeah, just 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 maybe just join that group as well. Um, and, and, and yeah, just, just get in touch. Okay, amazing. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, uh, Charmaine, for coming on this podcast. And um, I've learned so much from this interview, the internal family systems and EMDER and DIZ. There's so many things. Um, I'm sure our, our, lots of our listen, listeners will uh, gain some knowledge from it as well. So thank you so much. Is there anything, um, is there any last message that you would like to say? Yeah, um, yeah, just don't give up <laughs> and, um, and find that help. And it might mean that you have to go through many, many different stages to do that. But understand that everything is a stepping stone and absolutely nothing goes to waste whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Just keep persevering and keep asking and, and find, find that way through. And it'll be worth it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Charmaine. Thank you so much. Take care, then. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website, madhyasosan.com. Calm. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.